Warmly welcome everyone to this live update webinar. We will hear some more about the data-driven life science initiative that was announced yesterday, generously funded by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. We are very happy that so many have been able to join on such a short notice. And currently we are 233 participants in this webinar. My name is Sandra Falk and I work with external relations at Skylife Lab and have the pleasure to moderate this webinar for the coming one hour and 15 minutes. The webinar will be held in English and it will be recorded and made available on the web for later viewing. The program for the coming hour consists of short introductory remarks as well as a longer interview overview presentation by the Wallenberg Foundation on the background and aim of the DDLF program. We will also hear from the director of SciLife Lab and we will end the webinar by a questions and answers session. You are very welcome to send in questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function here in Zoom. Please note that we will only accept questions submitted through the Q&A function and these will be answered in the dedicated Q&A session at the very end. With that, it is now my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Carl Hendrik Heldin, Chair of the SciLife Lab Board. So let also me welcome you to today's webinar, during which we will learn about the exciting Wallenberg Foundation supported program on data-driven life science. We have all reasons to be pleased about this massive investment in an increasingly important research area. This will be of major importance for the research in Sweden. I would also like to express our sincere thanks to the Wallenberg Foundation for this insightful and timely investment. On behalf of the Science for Life Laboratory, I would like to say that we are glad to be involved in this important effort and we take on the challenge with enthusiasm and with determination. Again, very welcome to today's webinar. Thank you, Kalle, for these positive words. It is indeed a wonderful opportunity for Swedish life science. Next, we will hear a presentation from the Wallenberg Foundation where Executive Director Joran Sandberg and Head of Basic Research Steve Anderson will be discussing the background, aim and expectations of the program. Warmly welcome, Joran. Okay, I will share my screen. I hope you can see my presentation now. Uh, I will start with that. Many of you know what, what the Wallenberg Foundation is doing, but our foundation has a long-term goal on funding activities, and the core has always been bottom-up, bottom but not for the, for the strategic initiatives. That's always taken by the board. Uh, we have financed a lot of individual scientists in the Wallenberg Fellows Program, the Wallenberg Scholars and Clinical Scholars. Currently, we fund a bit over 200 <coughs> fellows and about 120 scholars. And uh, these scientists, they get money to do basically whatever science they want. Uh, 10 years ago, we launched projects, a project from us is somewhere between 30 and 40 million crowns for five years. And so far we have financed 220 and allocated 7 billion to that. We are not as big an in infrastructure as we used to be, but we are still together with Scott Road as the main sponsor of research infrastructure. Uh, but today's topic is strategic initiatives and, and um, why are we doing that? And why are we not just doing the bottom-up stuff? We're doing that in, for the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, the word Landskanglet for the betterment of Sweden. It's very, very important. It was written into the statutes over 100 years ago. So we try to build long-term competence in certain areas. And I'm going to go through what we have done the last 20 years since Data-driven life science is one of these initiatives. And as you probably can see from what I'm going to present, we have a very long-term view on, on life. It started 20 years ago with two consortia, Swedish and Wallenberg Consortium North. And about close to 1 billion crowns was, was allocated to this to build 
genomics, functional genomics, and bioinformatics in Sweden. And I would dare to say that this is, in one way, the basis for the creation of Sarlife Lab and also the Centers for Molecular Medicine. Three years later, we started the Human Protein Atlas that is still ongoing. And six years, we started a 10 year program to, to boost life sciences in Sweden. One of the reasons was that we were, we were afraid that, that the life science companies were, was not doing that well. It was, of course, a shock when AstraZeneca closed to the Telia. But we also saw in the bibliometric terms that Swedish life science was not developing as well as one could hope. So what we did was that we allocated a lot of money to Silaf Lab, sequencing equipment, cryo EM, single cell genomics, bioinformatics, and many other things. But we also launched four Wallenberg centers in molecular medicine in Gothenburg, Lund, Umeå, Linköping, and allocated money for 38 recruitments, international recruitments to these centers. The same year we started the mathematics program with the Royal Academy of Sciences. And already at that time, it was clear that we need a strong foundation in mathematics. And what we decided to do was to support basic mathematics. Mathematicians usually can get funding if they work on other people's problems, but they have had a lot of problems to get money for their, their own stuff. This program is running and it's going to run for at least another 10 years. The year after we started the Volumber Autonomous Systems and Software Program that three years later were extended with artificial intelligence. This is probably Sweden's largest research pro project ever. The total budget is six and a half billion and it's about four billion from us uh, from start to the end. Uh, the plan was to recruit 60 new research groups and have a grad school with 400 PhD students. Now this has been extended, so it's more likely that will be 80 to 100 groups uh, recruited. And the grad school will probably be somewhere between 500 or rather closer to 600 PhDs educated. Same year we started the quantum project, Walcott. Uh, this is quantum sensing, quantum computing, computing uh, and quantum communication. And may, the most important part is quantum computing, where Per Delsing and his staff as Chalmers is actually trying to build a quantum computer in Sweden. And they are doing fairly well. Uh, last year we, we financed a program at the Nordic, Nordic, Nord, Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics under the leadership of the Nobel Lord Frank Wilczek. And his view was that we should build theory groups in the interface between artificial intelligence and quantum technology. And since Frank is who he is, we of course decided to support that. Uh, the same year we started the WASP HS, Humanities and Society. And everything else we have seen is technology development. But as you know, technology development usually comes before the society has a chance to decide if it's bad or not. And the WASP HS program is a completely independent program that's that is going to uh, look at the pros and cons of the new technology that is developed. Finally, uh, this year or last year, we allocated 75 million to, to uh, uh, quantum power at the Swedish uh, national infrastructure. But this year, we, we donated 300 million to Linköping University to build a cluster of processing capacity for just for AI calculations. And this will serve Wallenberg supported projects, not the entire community. And it is in this context you should see data-driven life science. This is nothing that the board or CIV and I created came up with last spring. It's a thing that is developing, has been developing for the last 20 years. Uh, if you look at the blue side, the, the technology projects, for the 10 coming years, we, we are, have allocated 6 billion crowns to that. And if you look at the biology side of it, of course, a big thing that Steve will talk about the data driven life science is 3.1 billion. But we also continued our support of the, the first life science project until 2028. And the last thing is the continuation of Wallenberg Wood Science Center. So in total, this is more than 10 billion rounds that we put into these strategic initiatives. And of course, in order to get this to work, the interface between the biology medicine components and the technology, AI, quantum com 
components is extremely important to get up running. But it is also a, a possibility that very few have to, to really set this up. And what you see on the screen here is probably recruitment of over 250 research groups and grad schools that will graduate more than 1000 PhD students. And I think that's one of the basis that it will come out of this. It's a new breed of PhDs of young people that will understand both technology and biology and medicine. And that is what we hope for. And Siv Andersson that many of you know has been instrumental in setting up this pro pro program. So it's absolutely right that she will present the details. So over to you Siv. Yes. So I should uh, start by clarifying my roles in this. I think that most of you who listen now, you know me in my role as co-director for Scilab Lab since the past three years, but I have also been involved part-time working for the Wallenberg Foundation, as Joran said. And now that uh, the Wallenberg Foundation will place this major donation at Scilab Lab starting from next year, these two roles will become incompatible. So I will step down from my co-director role and there will be at the end of this year and next year there will be another co-director. So just so that you understand my sort of starting point in this. You all know SciLife Lab and it was started 10 years ago. And during these 10 years, it has developed an infrastructure in world class. We have about 40 facilities and they support about 1300 users and 3000 projects per year. And um, all together, it enables excellent research. All of these uh, projects generate a lot of data and the amount and types of data have grown exponentially during these 10 years. And when we had the International Advisory Board coming to visit us last year, they said that data may in the long term well become the most important aspect of Scilab Lab's impact. So data is now both a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge to organize and analyze and have all the competencies required for handling this data, but it's also a fantastic opportunity for data-driven life science. And as Jöran said, this is all what this big initiative is about. It's a national program and it will be placed under the Scilab Lab board. And when we say national, we mean all the major universities will be involved, UMU, uh, Uppsala, Stockholm, KI, KTH, SLU, the Natural His History Museum, Linköping, Göteborg, Chalmers and Lund. The support will be handed out in five phases and we think of this as a long-term program, but it can be stopped after each phase should there be a problem on the economic side, financial side, or with regard to the program itself. We have designed uh, the, the program around four strategic areas. So they are all in data-driven life science with a specific focus on cell and molecular biology, precision medicine and diagnostics, evolution and diversity, and epidemiology and infection biology. And here is a broad overview of the components of the program. There will be internationally recruited fellows, PhD positions, postdoc positions, industry, PhDs and postdocs, a research school, network activities, data support, databases, extra support to VABI, collaboration with VASP, and also uh, funding for management and a free resource. If you look into now the recruitment of fellows, there will be in total 39 recruitment packages, and they will be started during the first two phases, phases phase one and phase two. And each package has, has a budget of 17 million kroner and contains salary for five years at the BTRED and elector level. It also includes salary for two PhD positions, two postdocs and a bit of drift. And uh, the fellows, they will be recruited in collaboration with the universities, with, but uh, the appointments have to be approved by the SciLife Lab board. 
we have kind of allocated the, the positions now to the universities in these four strategic areas. And there will be normally two, when in some cases, one position per university. So 12 positions in precision medicine and diagnostics, 11 in epidemiology and infection biology. And these 23 positions will be placed at UMIO, KI, KTH, Uppsala, Linköping, Göteborg, Chalmers, and Lund. There will be another nine positions in cell and molecular biology, seven in evolution and biodiversity. And these positions will be placed at SLU and NRM, Stockholm University, KTH, UU, Linköping, and Chalmers. And they will be divided, all of these positions, into the first two phases. Then there will also be funding for a lot of PhD students and postdocs. So altogether, 263 PhD students. And 78 will be in the recruitment packages of the fellows. Then there will be another 140 academic PhD students and 45 industry PhD students. In addition, 230 in postdoc positions, 78 in the recruitment packages, 90 academic postdocs and 45 industry postdocs. And then of course, also the research school will be attached to these. When it comes to the years and the different phases, so the fellows, uh, the PhDs that goes with the fellows will, will be in phase one and two, whereas the academic PhDs will be in phase two, three, and four. And this is the same also for the industry PhDs. And the postdocs will be announced uh, in phase three and five, the ones that are uh, for open, open applications. Whereas again, the fellows, the postdocs will be in phase one and two. In addition to all these uh, people coming in, the PhDs and postdocs and fellows, there will also be funds to manage and analyze the data. So data support and the databases. And this will be to facilitate the collection, organization, and analysis of data, as well as to develop new tools and applications to be able to draw new scientific knowledge from data. We are also thinking about setting up strategically important Swedish data collections. But managing and analyzing the data is not only about data support and database, it's also very much about people. So you have all, I think, seen this picture where data is very heavy, but data scientists are very light. And although there are indeed a, a number of very good uh, bioinformatics researchers in Sweden and also bioinformatics experts at Scilab Lab, in comparison to the 3000 projects and all the massive amounts of data that we generate every year, there are still rather few people. So the part of this funding will also go to increased and prolonged funding to Wabi and other types of data support. And uh, for Wabi, this will be to support the new recruitments and analysis of cryo-EM data, where there is a big demand now. The interface between WASP and DDLS will be particularly important. And here, the DDLS program have earmarked 210 million kroner to this interface and WASP have earmarked on their side 120 million kroner. And these funds can be used, for example, for collaboration grants, joint PhDs, joint postdocs, joint courses, joint help desks, multidisciplinary centers, new recruitments, embedded researchers, and so on. It's not decided yet, but there are many, many opportunities here. So altogether, the data-driven life science is about developing a new type of working methodology. And although there are already people who can handle all these different steps, uh, we think that in the future, the next generation of scientists, they will be able to master and have knowledge about you know, everything, all this uh, rather complicated scheme of uh, handling data back and forth and drawing conclusions and making hypotheses, understanding models and so on. And we think that this program will really help that by both training people and providing the data support and databases that are necessary for doing so. If you now look a bit into the budgets. So for the first phase, it's allocated 580 million kroner. And here it's 340. The most of it is earmarked for the recruitment packages another 140 million kroner to data support and databases, 50 million to interactions with WASP, and then we have 20 million to Wabi, 
and another 20 million for administration network research school. And uh, for the first year, so next year, uh, there is a maximum of 110 million kroner can be used. So this is about 3% of the overall budget. So it will be a rather soft start to be able to get the program going. And here is a summary of the full 12 year budgets. So altogether, the recruitment packages are a bit more than 650 million kroner. The PhD students and postdocs are a bit more than 1 billion kroner. Then we have interactions with WASP, 250 almost. And we have the databases, data support and lobby. And that's almost another 1 billion. And finally, 259 million kroner is includes the free resource management and network activities. And all of this funding, of course, has to be carefully managed. So there has to be a very good organization involved. And as I said, the funding will be placed under the SILAF Lab Board. And the SILAF Lab Board will assign a director and a steering group who prepares decisions for the board. There will also be various working groups for recruitment, research school, and data support and databases. And Oli will speak a bit more about the integration of these funds into the Silent Labs organization. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much, Joran and C, for a great presentation, providing more insight into the ambition of the program. We are also happy that you are both available for the Q&A session at the end to answer additional questions. Uh, I would like to remind all participants, and now there is actually 366 of you, to keep writing in questions in the Q&A function of, of Zoom throughout the webinar, and we will take these once we reach the last part of the program. So next we will hear a short comment by Gunilla Westergren Torsson, director of WCMM in Lund and chair of the SciLife Lab National Committee. Welcome Gunilla. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. So I would just like say some words about the national perspective and implications. And now we start with the VCMM and VCMM is the, is the Wallenberg Centers of Molecular Medicine. So this was a donation from Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation as everything started 2015. And it is a center for translational research and to promote future research of leaders in academia and also to make life science in Sweden internationally competitive again. So the initiative, it includes recruitment of internationally leading successfully young researchers who have been offered a generous career package to establish their research teams. Importantly, also connected to this is the state of art research with infrastructure connected to SILAF Lab, but also Max4. Their research environments are integrated with public health care and also with life science industry. We are four centers. Uh, we are one center in Lund and one in Gothenburg, Linköping and Umeå. And we have mostly now recruited. Uh, the recruitment phase is uh, finished. So we have recruited 550 excellent research from worldwide. To those 50 research, there is also equal numbers of recruited clinical researchers. So we are nearly 100, 100 new PIs during this uh, five years period. Those have received prestigious grants. They are doing publication in nature and science. They are also driving a force establishment of a new research school on promoting the next generation of researchers. And they are also involved in teaching. We are working very close between the, the centers. So we help each other with different issues, but we are also arranging meetings uh, between the centers and we all the PIs yearly. Next. 
So the cellular flap is uh, in the middle of everything. And cellular flap are uh, um, giving us new technology and also integrating the centers between uh, the different centers in Sweden and also providing cutting edge technology. So it's a very close collaboration with Cellular Lab. On top of this, uh, we also have the NSC, which is a, a national committee uh, connected to Cellular Lab, where we are working with evaluation of different technologies and how we could uh, provide different uh, um, types of things in the country and strengthen uh, the different technologies. So there are two things, it's the VCMM centers and it's also the NSCs that are taking national perspective in how we could uh, interact in a better way. Next slide. So also connecting till to this, um, we are so happy that we now can continue our center with a new um, uh, the grant, so we can continue longer than 2024 with our centers, but also have new position and also working with data driven uh, science. So it will expand. We have our four centers uh, alone, uh, Yateboy, Lin, Shopping, and Umeå, but it will also include more universities in the whole uh, perspective now, and also VASP and uh, VACOT in this. Um, uh, initiative. So I think this is a really great opportunity for Sweden that we strengthen life science and are creating a national framework of national data driven science. And I'm happy to see what or, or to, to help with this for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunilla. Great that you could join us for a bit on such a short notice, even though you are tied up with other obligations. So I regret to say that Gunilla will not be able to join us for the Q&A session at the end. But uh, however, all other speakers will be present for this session. And I'm happy to see that questions are now coming in. So please feel free to keep on writing. So last but not least, as the final presentation before we reach the Q&A session, we will hear from the director of SciLife Lab, Olli Kallioniemi, on the DDLS initiative from the SciLife Lab perspective. Welcome, Olli. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sandra. And, and let me also start uh, by saying, saying uh, very big thanks to the Wallenberg Foundation <clears throat> for this major initiative, it's, it's really uh, uh, significant considering that these are difficult times and this is really a long-term initiative, a, a transformative initiative in, in many ways. So we are extremely happy about it. And I'm sure that I speak for the whole life science community when, when I say so. I, I would also like to thank the Asylum Lab board, the management, the operations office and everybody in the community that we have been chosen uh, as a site for this. So this is both an opportunity, but it's also a responsibility, and hopefully we are we are we have earned the trust of the whole nation of being a, a, a hub for such a major uh, initiative like this one. Uh, so uh, about a year or two ago, we started to develop a silent lab roadmap for the future for the next ten years. And as a theme for that, we considered that we should uh, go from a technology-driven organization to a technology and a data-driven organization. And this concept of data-driven life science was already kind of a, uh, a built in to the strategy of SciLife Lab. So it's an integral part between the infrastructure research and other functions at SciLife Lab. So uh, now that we heard uh, that uh, Wallenberg is, is uh, now ready to make this significant investment, and as you heard uh, uh, Jöran explaining the logic from the Wallenberg side on terms of how it makes sense, I would maybe also like to say how it makes perfect sense from the SciLife Lab strategy point of view uh, as to how uh, data-driven life science is a key thing for all of us in, in life science. And I'll now explain a bit on what, what that thinking is based on. 
So uh, it's obviously of no surprise to anybody that we live in the era of big data and everywhere around us, a lot of data is being produced. And actually we often think that life science is somehow special in terms of producing so much data that nobody else produces as much data. But look at these things, for instance, all this continuous data that comes out of, let's say, wearables, 30 petabytes per day, social media platforms, four petabytes per day. So compared to that one, all the accumulated data that we have actually today in EBI is massive, 300 petabytes, but it's no, by no means exceptional. These types of data amounts are all around us and, and we definitely need to have better ways of handling all of these uh, uh, data sets. Uh, as you know, and life science data sets continue to increase at a rapid rate some 50% per year, so in a way doubling every two years. And this is probably not going to just sort of continue, but it's likely to accelerate as we get new tools uh, that are being analyzed uh, or producing the data. And also life science data is extremely complex. It's also very interconnected. And, and this picture, for instance, on the EBI databases on how they link with external sites. So we truly enter in biology uh, to the big data uh, era. And, and we need to uh, be able to handle this uh, situation into the future. And this is obviously where the data-driven initiative comes from. We often think about life science data in terms of publications. And I like this particular picture from Nature last year where they had visualized all Nature publications uh, over the uh, uh, lifetime of Nature. So this is 88,000 publications in this picture. Every little dot is one paper in nature. Obviously important papers for sure, but it's a minute amount of the total number of publications uh, uh, published every year. So you kind of wonder at how can ever really read and understand all these relevant publications, particularly the associated data linked to them. And I think this is a challenge for us as a research community that not only should we be producing the next little dot here, trying to get the next nature paper, we should also try to understand what all of this means, interpret it and analyze all the, all the accumulated data sets. Uh, I'll get back to this picture in a, in a short while. So the publications is obviously only one part. Uh, then we have all the raw data that comes with these papers. So, it's been uh, uh, really bad in the, in the past, but now about 20% of the published papers have raw data available in a fair format, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm sure that this is one aspect that we want to promote that all data should be fair. Uh, and, and, and we are very far from it also in, in Sweden and in terms of molecular medicine. This is from a recent Norfolk review indicating that all areas that are red are not satisfactory. Yellow is not really good, blue is uh, uh, okay, but like omics data, molecular data in life sciences or health sciences, it is really not well uh, available at, at the moment. So clearly there are needs to improve fairness uh, of data. But let me then turn into a scientific process. What does this program really mean for a particular for a given scientist. So if we visualize it using this nature, beautiful nature uh, uh, networks, uh, how you are sitting on uh, top of previous literature and data, and you need to mine as a scientist, all this previously accumulated data. And the better you base your new study on comprehensive analysis of such data, the better and uh, bigger the impact of your science in the future is going to be. And maybe the more likely you are going to discover something truly uh, uh, important. So this is all about sort of a looking back and then uh, projecting into the future in terms of what your uh, uh, sort of contribution to life science is going to be. And we think that the data-driven life science is really going to help you in this inter, uh, interface and in this uh, setting where you plan studies. So this is a collaborative, multidisciplinary capability. 
uh, it's obviously data driven, but I think it's it it should link to any curiosity driven research as well. Anybody can uh, benefit from this. We obviously have the infrastructure for data production. We are going to recruit new talent uh, to mine data. We have a na truly national research collaboration, uh, like Gunilla just described. We have education and training activities, data support, data uh, bioinformatics. Uh, we need to consider particularly in health sciences, the legal and ethical implications. And then it's a wonderful opportunity to link to strong uh, data science, AI capabilities and computational advances. So I think this places Sweden, life scientists and all of us into a unique opportunity to, to, to transform how life science is being done. And that is actually how I like to visualize this program. So the background for it is the increased life science. The background for it is the computational advances, AI and so forth. And then we need a data-driven life science program to link it to four different areas in this case of life science that are the, the uh, uh, target of this one. And, and no little, no less than change how life science is being practiced largely through recruitments and training, but obviously research and other initiative uh, uh, as well. I would also like to pay emphasis to this little circle that not only is this about better handling the data, the new data that is being produced, it's also about better understanding the existing data to plan the next experiment to uh, move the field uh, forward. So DDLS, and we just use this abbreviation now all the time, is not just a bioinformatics program. It is not just about processing new data. It's just not about the fairness of the data, not just about the data science, not just about the AI and, and HPC uh, capabilities. It's about all of this thing, but with the focus on improving life science. And this is a, a project where we have an opportunity to do really nationwide uh, collaborations at multiple different levels, be it on the PI level, postdoc, PhD student, research school, network activities with industry collaboration, databases and so forth. So this is really a collaboration program uh, overall. And I would like to maybe point out that this starts very much from the recruitment aspects of it. So, so uh, this will be the phase one. And, and if you are now concerned that did I miss the boat, what can I do? There is plenty of time for you to join and contribute like Lee, uh, Steve indicated. This first year will be very much a startup year in 2021 and we can build and plan this uh, forward. So I would like to say that this is our DDLS program, but I would also, for all of you, 360 or some people there and all of the thousands of people in the community, like to say that this is also your DDLS program. So uh, I'll quote uh, uh, a, a famous uh, president, John F. Kennedy, ask not what DDLS can do for you, as what you can do for DDLS. So I think we want to make this a collaborative effort and, and we suggest that you're active. And how can you be active? Well, let's start from suggest nominations for our national steering group. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and the working groups and tasks that we are going to do. And then consider how does your university or department, how can it contribute to DDLS? Ask questions, be active. This is a 12 year program. So this is really a long run, but we have to really make a major impact here. We have to change life science. I mean, that's what the Wallenberg Foundation is uh, supporting this for. And, and that's also what we feel at life science that this can be uh, transformative. So what really happens next? So as Steve uh, indicated, the Silac Lab uh, board will oversee the DDS program. And even though we now talk about it as it's being launched already, it has to be decided to be launched. And I think we need commitments from all the stakeholders who are going to be uh, participating that they are really committed and willing to, to collaborate here. We need to uh, uh, 
nominate a steering group for this effort that will uh, uh, go through a detailed strategy work and plan many of the steps that we now describe in bigger terms, all the details still need to be worked out. And there will be working groups on data recruitment training, maybe other things as well. And then comes the action. And like the recruitments hopefully can start early next year uh, is, is our, our wish. So we are uh, meeting now a couple of times with the Silent Lab board to plan how this gets going. We hope to get the DDLS steering group up and running uh, by the end of the year as well, so that in 2021 we can fully launch the program. And when I say we, I mean the whole community and all the participants uh, uh, included, Silent Lab here acting as a coordinator of these activities. So with that, I have come to the uh, end of what I wanted to say, maybe just the point that we want to create now uh, vehicles by which we can communicate this. There is already a page, many of you have visited it uh, on the Silent Lab webpage on data-driven life science. There is a, also a form where you can uh, fill your, send your questions and, and comments. And besides us answering them today, we will obviously do that also otherwise. And you feel free on any matters, contact us through this uh, particular uh, email that I have here. So again, thank you everybody. Thank you everybody for participating as well. And again, thanks to Wallenberg Foundation for such a, a wonderful initiative and everybody who have planned this. I hope this will be good. Thank you. Thank you, Olli, and, uh, and thank you to all of today's speakers. We're delighted to have summoned everyone on such a short notice, and also that all of you participants have taken the time to join this uh, webinar. So now we have reached the questions and answers sessions when, where our presenters are available to answer your questions. And um, we will do our very best to provide answers to all questions, but in case we do not manage time-wise, we will also post the answers to the most uh, frequently asked questions on the web. And um, I will alternate a bit. We have received questions also prior to this webinar to the, to the form, which is open on the web page and which will continue to be open on the web page for, for the coming weeks or so. So you can continue to send in, in questions through that form. But trying also to to see there are some overlapping questions. Maybe we can start by looking. There are several questions regarding the, the group leader or, or fellow positions, uh, namely how one applies for these and um, when they will be open for applications and what the requirements are. And, and also there's been questions about how the distribution between the universities, uh, uh, how set that is and um, why, for example, SLU has uh, the evolution and biodiversity when it could also have other topics. Would you maybe, I, maybe I should start with that. Yep. If, sure. I, if I take SLU, the reason why they are in evolution and biodiversity is that that's the strongest subject at that university. And we have done our homework at the Wallenberg Foundation. As you know, we, we allocate a lot of money and every year we have about 600 international reviewers. So I think we have a fairly good view of the strength of the different Swedish universities. So we started with that we had close to 40 positions to distribute, and we wanted to distribute them in four thematic areas, as, as he presented. And we have based the distribution on where we know that there is critical mass in science. And of course, there are many other places that could also do. If you take infection biology and medicine, places like Umeå, Karolinska, Lund and Uppsala is in the forefront in our analysis. And, but there is also very strong infection bio biology in Gothenburg. Since the Sci-Life universities and the VCM universities have four positions, uh, not everyone will be satisfied, but we have done a thorough analysis on the strength of the different universities. And we will, the foundation will not, probably not allow that the university change the overall direction. But if you, take, if you take epidemiology and infection biology, if that is awarded to a university, it's a very, very broad topic. And, and that has to be, be uh, worked out in collaboration with the university and Sci-Life Lab 
how that position should be, be advertised. Uh, and that, that is a process that is coming up. When it comes to, we want to see international recruitment. Uh, of course, we, uh, people that are in Sweden can, can apply too, but our, our driving force is to get more talent to Sweden. And then you can say that's unfair to the people that are in Sweden. <clears throat> in, in one way, yes. But it is nothing that hinder the, each university to also finance additional positions to this. And then the recruitment process will be built on the recruitment uh, uh, framework at each university. As you know, there is a difference between the different universities. Uh, uh, but um, in the end, it will be the university and uh, the normal procedure that, that will work on how to recruit these people. But we will not change the direction of the, I mean, the overall th thematic direction. And I think that's a thing that uh, the Wallenberg Foundation can allow ourselves to do since we actually are the financer of it. Of course, we hope that there will be many other positions too that will link into this program. Yeah. And maybe one can also emphasize that uh, this is for the fellows specifically, and then there will be all the PhDs and postdocs in addition that uh, can go in various uh, parts of these uh, four thematic areas to the different universities. So it's not designing everything. No, that's a very important point. Uh, the, I mean, the, the open calls for, for PhDs and postdocs and the access to infrastructure and, and, and lobby support will be completely based on, on, on scientific quality of the proposals. Maybe also at the point that uh, if you consider SciLife Lab Fellows and WCMM Fellows, that is a good sort of a uh, reflection of what the types of people are that would be eligible for the group leader positions and the types of people we seek in this program as well. Great, excellent. Now I can see that there is one question who, which has sort of been upvoted and that I would like to take it. And that's uh, how are you planning to support researchers that are current, that currently do data science in biology and facilitate recruitment of computational researchers at computationally oriented departments? So maybe I can take that one. I think it's a very good uh, question. And I think this is part of the uh, interface between VASP and, uh, and DDLS. And here we have discussed alternatives like, for example, the embedded researchers and embedded experts to give opportunity to, for example, a, a computationally oriented biologist to work for some time in a more computational department and vice versa. To it. So there, I mean, it's not at all decided, but uh, these discussions are going to go going. So I think that's really an important part of this program to bridge that gap. Excellent. And then there is, um, are these packages allocated for young researchers or is it for everyone? Yes. So I guess that uh, is the recruitment packages. So that is allocated for the young researchers. Yes, and, the, and there was another question also, if, if it is, they will be limited, if there will be a five-year uh, limit after PhD for these positions or? That, that is different at the different universities. Yes. Okay. And then we have a question, will there be some attempt to ensure recruitments are gender diversity balanced? How many persons will be internationally recruited versus within Sweden? We already heard that there is emphasis on the international recruitments, but there is, and of course, we uh, we are st strong supporter of gender balance, and we are probably the only only uh, uh, supporter of science that has a proper gender balance. Last last project called sixty percent of the PIs were females, and for the fellows, it's forty five percent. But this should, of course, follow the rule at, at each university in regard to, to gender balance and, and diversity. Yes, and then there is, um, what strategy will you use to improve the data and code documentation and sharing practices? Few academic labs implement best industry practices and in some cases, this has terrifying implications like the work on Professor Neil Ferguson demonstrates. Anyone that wants to comment? 
Well, that, this is another very important part of the program, obviously. Um, and I don't think we have a strategy right now, but uh, I'm sure this will be an important uh, to develop such a strategy. Maybe Ulle can say something about this. Well, I, I should maybe also say, say the point that, that we, we could have said in the beginning that, that uh, there will be a steering uh, group for the program that will look at many of these details. There will be working groups that will set up all these strategies uh, uh, in, in great detail. So I don't think that there is a point for us to say that we have all the answers on, to all the details on how this program will be uh, managed. And this is where we really uh, look for input from the community. And I think we are open to every expertise and idea uh, that is relevant to this program. And, and uh, these are the types of things that we really need to sort out. This is absolutely a critical point on, on, on uh, fairness of the data, on, on reproducibility of science, and what we can do to improve these uh, uh, things, and also link this program up to international initiatives in this sense, which is like the next question there. <laughs> exactly. So maybe, we, maybe you want to continue on this, then linking up to EU initiatives and then and, um, EOSC and... and um, well, Maybe I say this part of it, that, that since this is a Wallenberg funded uh, uh, education, training and research initiative, this is by nature international. And I think this is important that what we do is at the high international level. So when we talk about the WDDLS, uh, uh, this is not following the exact principles of how we manage the national infrastructure where access to national infrastructure is only within certain uh, national priorities. So by default, we are open to international collaborations and international initiatives and should link Sweden with uh, the data science and open science uh, communities and principles elsewhere. And like the examples that I showed about the EBI, we definitely need a strong link to EBI. And, and they have already expressed a strong interest uh, to working with us on initiatives like this. Great. And then we have a question uh, regarding why there are no data science fellows. I mean, there is nothing that hinders that 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 under the under the topics that, that we have indicated that it will be a data scientist that is recruited. That's up to the university. Yeah. But don't, don't forget that we, we, we are going to re recruit over 100 groups in, in data science, software, and AI in, in, in the VASP project. So I think this is a really good question to clarify as well, that, that obviously the, the pure data scientist is perhaps the person who better fits to the VASP community, whereas here we would like to embed data science scientists mm -hmm. to the life science environment and make them contribute in that uh, field and be interested in driving. Because I think life science needs data scientists. Uh, and I hope that this area will be of interest to data scientists as a career uh, structure. So, so I think we definitely are, are uh, sort of a, uh, interested in having these people join. And then there was a question that came in earlier also through the web form that in data-driven life science, who produces the data? Would you like to comment on this also? Well, uh, I, I think that is obviously like she was presenting in her uh, talk that SciLife Lab already today runs uh, through 3000 projects to uh, uh, 1500 investigators who are producing data. And to a large extent, this is an operation where we kind of they often then then uh, see data uh, being produced, but not really being uh, sort of a systematically analyzed and processed and made available in a fair format. So I think we need to improve the SciLife processes in this uh, sense and the life science processes in the entire country in that sense. So that's one aspect. But then the other point that I really want to emphasize that this is not just about producing new data. I think that is a traditional way of considering what, uh, uh, how, how bioinformatics and how data science should be, should be practiced, that it's only about analyzing new data. 
it's as much about mining everything that has already been produced by the global research community and making new links, making new conclusions out of the existing data and maybe linking it with your own data and forming uh, analysis. So as I indicated, there's plenty of data to start from. And obviously we would also like to see Swedish data like the Protein Atlas and other major initiatives have already done play a major global role uh, in that sense. And I think we need to organize data better for that format. Thank you. And then we have a question regarding co-funding from the universities. Um, would you see, like to comment on that? Yes, so for the uh, fellows position, there will be co-funding needed. And so this will have to be discussed with the universities and they will have to accept to uh, pay the co-funding co or the, the rest of the overhead that is not paid by KAB. We pay a bit over 20% in overhead and, and uh, the remaining overhead has to be taken up by, by the universities, which is a common practice. And you can, you, you can think that 20 or 22% is not the, what is needed, but we have a sister institution in a country south of us that pay four to five percent. So, so in, in private uh, uh, funding, 22 percent is, is, is a high level. And we, of course, have talked with the directors at the different universities about that. There is no need, need for additional co-funding like, like uh, PhD positions or, or other things. Maybe I would like to come back to the point that I said at the end, that obviously Wallenberg funding is the major uh, part of this whole program and uh, the, the core. But I think we all would very much like to see universities contributing to a national program with their own sort of a specialty areas and, and, and also contributing funding, but that's not a required co-funding at all. We hope that that will happen. Yes, and then we have a question about the precision medicine part uh, of the program and if there will be grants directed towards clinical trials for clinical investigators that aim to produce high quality data. So, so maybe I take that as a, as a professor of molecular precision medicine. So I, I think we could equally have, e easily have a one hour uh, event just in discussing what aspects of uh, precision medicine should this program be engaged with? And I think I have certain ideas here, but, but I think we really need to have a community uh, discussion and discussion within the steering group, and maybe the steering group will need to set up a working group on, on, on how we best uh, allocate and address the issues in, in precision medicine, because they are obviously many. And this is a very uh, multifaceted uh, concept on how do we best advance uh, uh, precision medicine and how do we best advance it in a data-driven manner and within this program. So I would rather say that possibly yes to that question, but, but this is really one of these uh, dozens, uh, if not hundreds of questions that need to be addressed in more detail in the planning of the, of the uh, program in detail. Yes, and I think the next question is also uh, has to do with, with how to link up things and how, how the satellite lab facilities and, and, and platforms can contribute to the, to the program. Would you like to comment all these still on this? Well, uh, I, I think this is the, uh, like I said in the very beginning, uh, this is built on the satellite lab platform concept. And I think we can uh, hopefully do a, a great deal more in, in addressing uh, the data arising out of these SILAB lab platforms and, and how we process data going forward, how bioinformatically analyze uh, data better and how do we link the data produced at SILAB lab to the DDLS program as a whole. So I think there will be synergistic ways in both directions. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is uh, uh, there's plenty of things to, to, to do, but I, I'll, I'll leave it at that at the moment. And then there's questions about the fellows recruitments. 
is it the liability of each university or will there be a central recruiting committee? And um, if a, the postdoc and PhD positions will be uh, a separate thing from the fellow recruitments. We've touched on this already, but... Yeah, but, but for, first, first the universities has to, to agree with the Silaf lab leadership and, and the board of Silaf lab on, on the thematic area within, for example, in, in infection biology. After that, it will be a, a common advert from Silaf lab, but also individual adverts from the universities. And then the appointment process has to be run by each university. We, we have used that, uh, or we or we, but WASP has used that uh, for all the recruitments they have had. And, and they have introduced a thing that I, I, I think is good. In the recruitment panel at one university, it will always be, be a member from another, a VASP member from another university involved to get an open process. I think that part is fairly easy. When it comes to the postdocs and, uh, and the PhD position, it will be up to SciLife to appoint committees that evaluate them and give priority. Yeah. Uh, and then we have a question about uh, the Swedish health system and how to make data available uh, in the healthcare system or make it computable. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely question and I would love to be able to say a very clear answer to this question. Uh, and I think this really uh, goes back to the issue that obviously the precision medicine initiative needs to be done together with the healthcare community and with the regions and so forth. And obviously we have a lot of uh, both ethical and legal um, sort of a boundaries which we need to work on. And, and I think this is why the, the program has a component that I think uh, Jöran and Siv have planned as part of this that, that will specifically also address the ethical and legal. Usually we talk about ELSI implications, the ethical, legal and social implications of this research and maybe removing and or at least alleviating some of the restrictions and, and problems that we currently have in accessing data for research and obviously there may be uh, wonderful technological solutions on various types of federated systems that would allow us to maybe maybe access that that type of data and I hope this program can uh, address both the the LC types of aspects but also technological aspects that could help access to health data but this is no simple question obviously. Yeah, and if you like to uh, say something about the the fact that there are ethical and other uh, aspects being funded. Yes, I mean, we have the VASP HS program that, of course, has to, to look into that. And the collaboration between between VASP, VASP HS and, and the data driven life science is important to develop. I would like to bring up another question that came up. If, if this will reduce the Wallenberg Foundation's support to fellow scholars and projects? And the answer is absolutely not. Fellow scholars and projects are the core of bottom up, is a core of, of, of the foundation. I mean, as you might know, we have had a bit of a difficult time now since the dividends, we, we give out dividends from our companies next year and dividends <coughs> has not come out the way we hope this year. And one of the reasons is that banks is not allowed to give dividends, which means that we are going down from the, for the foundation from 2.5 to 1.7, 1 1.8 billion next year. But the year after 2022, we will be up to 2.5 <clears throat> and we will increase with three to 5% every year. So we will protect the fellows, the fellows, the scholars and the project calls. And we have a question for uh, regarding the industry PhDs and if co-funding will be needed from the industry partner. Yes, in, in, VASP, in the VASP grad school that has 400 PhD students now, the 100 of them are industrial PhDs, uh, where VASP contributes with roughly 50% of, of, of the cost and the, the company and 50% of the cost. 
it started a bit slow uh, four or five years ago, but but now there is a tremendous interest in industry to, to have industrial PhDs, and we will hope the same in this field. Uh, we also have what we call the, the industrial postdocs. Uh, that will be introduced here and, and most likely in VASP2. That's a new concept that is not developed yet, but the thought is, of course, that the, uh, someone that takes a PhD at, at an academic institution and has not decided if they want to leave for industry or stay can spend during two years 50% of the time in both environments. And that has to be developed by, by Silaf Lab and us together how these positions will be, be created. Yeah. And there's a question if, uh, if researchers working at the Silaf Lab facilities can apply for positions in this program. Well, I, I don't think that there are any restrictions whatsoever from anybody applying to the positions that make sense for them to apply to, obviously considering their career states and others. But like Joran said earlier, most positions are done in an, in an international competition. So, so that obviously will, will impact, but absolutely people are free to apply when such calls will be open and available. And again, maybe worth to point out that the beginning of the program will not feature open PhD and postdoc uh, uh, programs. They will be mostly targeted to the newly recruited fellows and the groups that will form the nucleus of this program. So the freely available PhD and postdoc programs will come a bit later. And then there is a question about how existing research groups and existing data benefit from this program. Yeah, I think this depends a bit on the topic of the existing research groups. Uh, and uh, I think with the data support database uh, part, many of the groups who maybe are not so fluent in this area will benefit a lot. And I hope that those that are experienced and have already the competences and skills will be able to contribute to the training and uh, to provide the software and help out with solutions in various different ways. And I think this is actually a very essential question. I like this question very much in the sense that at the end, we hope that this program provides uh, uh, a, a kind of a collaborative environment for many people to participate, whether they whether they are directly funded from, from this program or not, and that we can address important issues together uh, through this program. So, so absolutely, it's actually very important that we try to get people to, to, to participate and contribute to this effort, like I said with my John F. Kennedy analogy in the, in the talk. So the question to, the answer to this, uh, if multidisciplinary research projects uh, providing and producing, analyzing data will be the main focus of, of, of this initiative. So at least multidisciplinary projects will be encouraged. Well, may, may, maybe point out the, the issue that absolutely the multidisciplinary projects are a key, but at the end, this is a research and training and education initiative that hopefully changes the bigger life science seen in, in Sweden and the way that we operate in life science. So I think that overall concept is the, is the major thrust and obviously multidisciplinary research is a great and important component of that. And I think it will uh, directly or indirectly transform probably also under graduate education because there will be requirements for the people come in as PhD students and I hear already from universities that they are now planning to change some of their master programs. So I think it will have an, an impact, although maybe it's not planned directly at the undergraduate level, but it may also affect uh, graduate studies since uh, when you are in this interdisciplinary area, it is quite complicated and maybe some parts have to be we have to rethink about some aspects of the graduate uh, training. Thank you. So that answers the graduate questions. Uh, and then there is a question regarding collaboration from universities not included in the plan. Every, it's open for, for everyone. I mean, the open calls for, for 
PhD positions, postdoc positions, access to, to facilities and support is open for all scientists in Sweden. Uh, and we have a question about uh, if the initiative is only about human health, and that it's what about livestock? That um, at least the environmental parts are part of the program. But would someone like to say something more about the focus areas? I mean, there is an there is, is a focus area on evolution and biodiversity, and it's not specified that what 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 will be within. Uh, epidemiology and, and uh, infection biology yet but there is of course a focus it will be a lot of focus on human health um, and then there is a question what is the support for data generation and new technologies in this program or is it purely focused on processing data Well, if it's about uh, sort of a data technologies, uh, it, it certainly hopefully has a lot of contributions that we can make, but this is not like a technology uh, infrastructure program from the SciLife Lab perspective. So, so uh, we think that the national SciLife Lab infrastructure will be developed through other means, such as the national funding. Uh, which actually is key to then keeping this program running well as well. But uh, this is not planned to, uh, at the moment at least, specifically to address uh, wet lab technologies, but very much on what the data coming out of those technologies would, would be, how that would be handled. And will, uh, will you help fill strategic gaps in the universities by supporting lecture and professor level positions? The more senior. It is not up to the Wallenberg Foundation to, to, to fill strategic gap, gaps at the universities. That's up to, to the universities to do themselves. Our focus is to build long-term competence at the universities and do that in an environment that is already quite productive. Uh, there are quite many longer comments here also that um maybe you have the uh, the point here about wasp does not currently fund biology data science i think that is one of the issues that this uh, program should address that that many of the activities in wasp are as far as i un understand directly to the interest of the companies participating and this has not had a major life science component now but we have had already discussions with the wasp program and i think that aspect will certainly change uh, uh, dramatically i would say i mean that is absolutely correct wasp has a different focus but as presented by Siv, there is always almost 300 million crowns allocated in between the programs and you should also remember that WASP will graduate probably more than 500 PhDs within this field that uh, we should try to recruit over to the biology side, at least some of them. Excellent. I, I, I also see that time flies when you're having fun and we have lots of unanswered questions, but we will go through these and then the post the answers on, on the web page for the, for the most common ones. So um, thank you all for joining today and for an active question and answer session and uh, looking forward to continued discussions and joint efforts onwards. And now I will give the final word to, to our director, Olli, for a short closing remark. So please, Olli. Well, I will first of all thank Sandra for uh, uh, moderating the discussion today and all, all our uh, speakers here, and particularly Jöran for taking the time to come here wishing good luck for Siv as, he, as her new role at, at uh, uh, Koave. And uh, just want to thank everybody. And as I said, this is a program where we should tr try to work together to do big things. And I very much look forward to collaborations. And uh, we, we will be in touch. There will be many other events similar to this one. Uh, we need to uh, engage in discussions of this type and, and uh, in the meantime, just be in touch with us through the website and through the, through the emails. 
And I hope that you will feel that this is really a transparent open planning process that we are going to go through and you will have an opportunity to participate in. With that, thank you for today. And, and this is a great beginning and, and we'll be uh, continuing from here. Thank you.